Andrew Chadwick is here, everybody. I don't know if you're ready. I don't know. I don't know if you want to show Andrew how much you love the show by grunting along with me in the beginning, but hopefully you will. Uh! Yes! Oh my! No way! Crazy? No, I'm not crazy, Barry. Wow! Welcome, everyone, to the Podcast Engineering Show. My name is Chris Curran. I produce podcasts for big companies, and I also uh, run Podcast Engineering School, where you can learn how to produce podcasts at a professional level. I have a background in audio engineering in the music business, and since I entered podcasting almost eight years ago, I've noticed a huge lack of audio skills in podcasting, so that's where this show can help. I can help you understand the deeper aspects of audio production, and you can use it so that your show sounds better or your clients' shows. So if you implement the best of what you learn here, your podcast will sound a lot better, and you'll spend less time producing them. Uh, the next semester of Podcast Engineering School starts in January, but today... We're here with Andrew Chadwick, and we're connected in a cool way. And this is going to be an awesome episode because it's not like really any ep- any other episode we've done of this show, because Andrew has quite a background. He's an audio mixer and editor, and he's been involved in radio for many years, and now he's involved in podcasting. He's part of the team that produces Pod Save America. I'm sure you've heard of that show. So Andrew, welcome to the Podcast Engineering Show, man. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm going to give you a huge crowd cheer. Oh, I got applause. Andrew Chadwick. That's some real applause right there. That is definitely I mean, this not is serious. <laughs> All right, I'm going to hold they on. Just keep going. Woo. They fade out quick though. You know, they they're excited and then, and then, then they're just and quiet. And it's over. It's done. It's done. I mean, you know, it's not just you, Andrew. <laughs> but uh Andrew, you and I met at uh Podcast Movement about a few weeks ago. So this is this will be published, I think, in October. Right now, we're talking, I think it's September 4th. And we met a few weeks ago at Podcast Movement. Uh, that was your first Podcast Movement. So what did you think of that? It was. It was fun. And I mean, I learned a lot. Not, I don't think, the things I necessarily went in expecting to learn. But you know, got some real good kind of trial by fire introduction to the world of podcasting as it exists outside of my own fairly narrow experience. Met a lot of great people, which was fantastic. Yeah, I'm excited about other podcast conferences in the future. Right? Yeah. So you your background is in is in radio, like live radio production, right? Pretty much. It it is. Yeah, I am a long time radio engineer. I do not have a radio engineering job currently, but I spent um, about 11 years doing that professionally between two stations, one year in AM radio, and then about 10 years in public radio. Um, And I've done all sorts of other engineering front of house at a tiny little rock and roll club. Um, I started off working at a performing arts center on campus when I was in college. So I've done I've done a fair amount, but my focus really for a long time has been radio. Right. And now you're working on Pod Save America, which uh, let's start there. I mean, so normally, Andrew, on this show, we do a speed round and I ask the guests to tell me, you know, th- their podcasting setup, basically, like their mic and their, you know, their interface and what software they record into. But you you don't actually host your own podcast show, right? That is true. Yeah. No, I I don't host my own show. I really consider myself much more of an editor than a host. Um, I have had a series of jobs where I'm alone by myself in a dark room and I like it that way. (laughs) So being a host is not that's that's very far out of my comfort zone. Right. So, yeah. So that's why I'm psyched to talk to you about all the, you know, the post-production that you use and you perform every day. Wait, so let's talk about Pod Save America. Sure. I sure, actually yeah. don't listen to that show. I, I don't I've never heard that show, which I don't mm-hmm. I don't know what that means, but I'm not like a I'm not a big media kind of guy anyway. But um so describe what you do for Pod Save America. And you know, briefly at first and then we'll dig into it. So I basically mix and assemble the show for the team. uh, It's produced by Crooked Media in Los Angeles. They have a studio and their office is there and they record the show there. 
They ship it over to me via the magic of Google Drive, and I download the files, I put them all together, I make the requested edits. They usually send me an edit list, um, you know, a rundown of everything they want gone or shortened or whatever. Uh, if I have the time, which is about 50% of the time, I make a bunch of my own edits on top of that, usually less content, more technical. Um, then I assemble the show, I mix it down, I tweak it a bit, and then I ship it back to them for some final QC, and then they turn it around as fast as they can. Right, because uh, tw it, two episodes per week you're producing for, for that, right? Yeah, usually two, two at a minimum. With, with all the Democratic primary candidates, they've been trying to get every primary contender on so there have been a lot of bonus episodes recently plus they've done some traveling recently so there's live shows they do a couple of live shows um maybe two a month a little bit less than that so that adds a lot of bonus episodes in so yeah at least two shows a week and one of those shows is a pretty tight turnaround so it's a pretty specific process to get that show from tracked to aired or tracked to ready for air as fast as it needs to be. Right, right. So that's what I want to talk about now. So one of the shows per one of the shows each week needs a quick turnaround time. So go like hour by hour in the day. What day is it? A Monday or Tuesday? Monday. Monday's the quick turnaround show because you know they've kind of been out on the weekend and they need some time to do some reading and, you know, catch up to everything that's happened that they want to talk about. So they record, and this is a constant, the time zone thing is like constantly mind-bending for me. Uh. Um, they record at 11 Pacific, so that's one central. I live in central time. And they want the show up at 5 Eastern, so that's 4 Central. So I have three hours to turn around what is often, actually I have less than three hours. So they, they usually finish rolling somewhere in the realm of like 2.30 Central. So then I have about 90 minutes to put together a 90-minute show. Oh, man. And, 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 yeah, it's, and a, it's a lot. It's a lot. And, and so in that 90 minutes of like fast and furious production, like they're sending you edits, you're making some of your own edits, and then you're actually sending them back the mix of the show. So, and do they actually review the whole thing? They do. So usually I'll send some stubs first where like, well, they it's broken up into bits. So they'll often record um, for those who don't know the structure of the show. They do a longish news segment and then they do a shorter interview segment and they'll usually track the interview segment first. So they'll start that at 1 p. my time. And usually that's over by 1.30 my time. And they'll send me that file right away. So I just get right to it. I take that file. I throw it in the multi-track. Um, I'm using Audition. I've been an Audition user for a very, very long time. I was I was dedicated to Audition 1.5 for way longer than I should have been. Huh. Um, so I'll throw it in the multi-track. And a lot of times those interviews come without any major requested edit edits. And on those fast turnaround days, if they don't have any edits, if I don't hear anything while I'm cutting things together in the multi-track, then I won't make any extras. Um, a lot of times I'll, I'll pull out ums, I'll pull out little stutters here and there, but if I don't hear it, I'm not going looking for it basically. Right. So I will mix that down bring it up to a reasonable level and then ship it right back. And then someone will QC that interview while they're tracking the news segment. Got it. And then the news segment, they finish up, they do the same thing. They send it my way for a while in order to get speed in order to really turn it around quickly. I was using the stereo file that they sent me um, they track it a pro tools. And so they would have individual files and they also rolled on just kind of a flat stereo mix, which, you know, as you can imagine is super roomy, um, allows, you no know, wiggle room for coughing or other noises or anything. So I didn't love using that. 
And I just in the past month or two have started taking the time, the, a little bit of extra time to just go through and make all my fades, just duck everybody out when they're not talking so that only a single track is up at any given time. And that takes a little bit longer, but tr just truly makes the difference in terms of quality. So I'll do that, mix it down, go through the edit list and then ship it back. Right. Wow. Yeah, that does make such a difference. It takes more time, but it the final product is so much clearer and uh and it's better. just so hard to listen to something that's that's open mics that's just just flat level open mics it's really the roominess kills me and it's um you know to some extent it's hard to put my name on a product that sounds like that right and when i when i took a chance one day i had a little bit of extra time one day and i just took a chance and i was like all right i'm gonna do this as fast as i can just draw the curves i'm not listening to content very much i'm just listening i'm just crossfading you know the guys in and out and then I mixed it down and it just sounded so much better and it didn't take that much more time. So I've been able to do that and still get in, uh, get the show back for QC before, you know, the deadline. That's cool. Well, I want to ask you about Adobe Audition and, and you know, what kind of processing you're doing in there. But first, uh, I want to ask you, like, what is the purpose for having such a quick turnaround time? Because... You know, most podcasters, I mean, well, you probably know, most podcasters record their show and put it out, you know, weeks later, like there's no time, time is not of the essence. So what is it about Pod Save America that they want to record it and like literally under pressure immediately put it out? I think there's really two things. And, and this is me guessing, um, you know, I, I do have a good relationship with my producer, but I would say that it's. One, the news cycle, especially right now, is just super fast, is just so ridiculously, everything gets dated, everything gets stale so quickly. So it's like sometimes something will happen. I'm trying to be as generic and unbiased as I can here. Something, say, totally insane will happen on Tuesday, and they won't even talk about it on Thursday's show because a dozen other crazy things have happened since Tuesday that that thing on Tuesday no longer warrants the time. Oh my it's goodness. It's no longer in a previous world, the world we used to live in, that would have been a four or five, seven day news cycle item where the press would just kind of iterate over this thing again and again. And the white house press office would respond and they'd send people out to the talking head shows. And now it's just, different everything moves super quickly so i think that's a huge huge part of it the other part of it is i think they're aiming for east coast commuters i think they are looking so that east coast commuters while they're on their works wi-fi network can grab that file right before they get out of the building and then listen in their car on the way home because having lived on the east coast for the majority of my life i can tell you that the commutes are just brutal so it helps to have something something with you. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I I I totally understand that. Those are two very good reasons. And uh, yeah, it's weird that the news cycle is so fast, and it's so you're really doing a lot in in a few hours. And uh, of course, Barry here is with me. Uh, Barry is here with me in studio. Barry, what do you think Andrew's going to need to really you know help him get through those few hours and really produce a great show in time? What what is he going to need? You're going to need a couple of horses or a couple of mules. <laughs> oh, <laughs> all right. That's wisdom right there. The man's on top of it. I mean, maybe maybe you could talk to your producer. <laughs> yeah, I got to see, you know, I don't know what their um, equine budget is. I got to see if there's an equine line item. <laughs> yeah, that's a line item in, in the in the expenses. A couple horses or yeah. a couple mules. What is this for? Oh, it's for Andrew. Guys, Barry said I need it. So I'm just I'm just going to go out and pick a couple up. Is that cool? Exactly. All right. So Adobe Audition is what you're using. Yeah. And Adobe Audition is awesome. I was just talking to uh, a student who, well, she's going to start podcast engineering school in a few days. And she's using Audition. And Audition is, you know, if it didn't cost 20 bucks a month or 30 bucks a month, whatever it is, like 
I would probably use it, but uh, because it's it has it's it's a great DAW. So just briefly overview give give the overview of like how you're setting up your sessions in audition and maybe what like what kind of processing what effects and stuff are you using well so first i want to say like i do love audition i do hate the subscription model it's terrible i'm glad that it's expensible at least as a you know small business person mostly it's just a tool that gets me where i want to be that I also have the muscle memory for. I came up on Pro Tools. You know, I was using Pro Tools when I was in college in roughly the year 2000. I was using Pro Tools on um, OS 9 before we before everybody switched over to OS 10. Uh, I was Pro Tools certified on a couple of versions of Pro Tools. I love Pro Tools. I would not use it to make radio. Mm. I wouldn't use Audition to make a record either. Like they both serve to me, completely different use cases. Mm -hmm. And Audition to me, I think is so great for radio because it really allows you to do just quick and dirty editing, mixing. It allows me to turn something around um, just much more quickly than I'd be able to turn something around in Pro Tools. So structure, okay. Um, typically, I will have three well, so I produce the bits of the show at different times. Usually I get the ads well ahead of time, a couple days ahead of time. So I will throw the ads into the multi-track. Each of the guys gets their own track. You know, I fade them in and out, mix them down, um, cut out some of the nonsense, not all the nonsense because people like the nonsense. <laughs> and so they're, they're already done and ready to go. And then I will have a session for each of the bits. So I have an ad session, I have a news session, I have an interview session. And so those sessions are very straightforward. Those are just, everybody gets their own track. And then I, I make the fades to, to, to make things appropriate so that only one channel is open. Occasionally that'll get a little bit more difficult where sometimes we get audio that's, um, to, you know, a lot of times it'll be an in-studio interview. Dead simple. The files start at the same time. They're the same length. There's no delay to worry about. They're great. A lot of times we have a phone. Things get slightly hairier, but still pretty okay. Sometimes we'll do, you know, something like what we're doing now, some kind of tape sync situation, usually where the guest, usually politician, is on the phone. They're on their cell phone. And then we've got another one of their assistants is holding an iPhone up to their face and recording it in the voice recorder. And sometimes I get that file. Uh, sometimes that file is usable. Sometimes it's not, but I'll pull that in, align it. You know, I, I usually try to align it to, at the beginning of the conversation. Sometimes the delay is bad enough that I have to go back and, you know, adjust every interaction, every handoff between speakers. Right. Um, but so I'll have that session if there are edits requested, I will mix down the session. And this is where I think I'm going to deviate from a lot of people and maybe you. I will mix the session down to a file and I make my set I make my edits destructively on a single file in the Adobe single single track editor. Right. Um, so say I've got a list of, you know, 10 or 15 edits. I will go through and locate them via time code. I may, I, I drop markers for every edit so that, you know, my times don't shift as I make edits and then I will go back and do an edit pass. So I do one pass where I drop my markers. I do another pass where I make my edits. And then once all the edits are made, I'll do kind of some individual mastering on the, on that bit bringing it up to roughly the level I want it to be. And usually that's just the hard limiter um, because basically all, all I want to do is do some some peak control. So, you know, I'm bringing the level up for the whole thing and just, just really crushing down the outliers. Occasionally I will use the tube compression plugin in Audition. It's the only compressor in Audition that I really like. And I'll use that just to squish things down to, you know, roughly the same levels or get a, get a little bit more gain out of certain sections. Once I'm done with each of the individual sections, I will then have a master 
session building file. I call it, you know, I refer to it as assembly. Mm. And that in that session, I will have a voice track, an ad track, and then a music track. And I basically just put the show together. I don't use any templates. I'm not a big fan of templates. It's like just as much work for me to find my template file in the open dialog as it is for me to just like drop the files where I usually drop them. So I just don't bother. Right. And then once everything is in the place it should be, I mix it down. I give it another round of hard limiting. Uh, Sometimes I will do some spot hard limiting on certain sections if they're louder or softer than usually softer. I'm trying to bring something up to, you know, the average loudness of the entire file. And then I save it. I'm working 44 one, another place where I might deviate from a lot of people. I don't really dig 48 K, but I do prefer if I can get them 32 bit files. So I'll save it as a 44 one 32 bit file, and then I'll save it as an MP3, which I then will upload back to crooked. Yeah, that's awesome. I like how you have different se- a different session for each segment of the show, and you sort of like, yeah, I love that. It really just makes it so much easier to think of it as one bit. Just, I'm doing this, I'm mixing this, I'm editing this, and then I'm done with that thing. And now I have another thing that I have to mix and I have to edit, and then you put it all together. I do think where I run into trouble is level matching between segments. I'm kind of, you know, making my life more difficult on that front, but I think I'd rather have to deal with that than having to put everything in one big session. And I truly, I don't think I would have the time because I have to get sessions back in bits. I don't think I would have the time to, to do it in one session. I don't think it would work out. Yeah, that makes sense that doing it separately. I also, do it that way and i also uh for instance for my clients i mix i'll mix down the conversation to either a mono or stereo file usually well mono i i mix the conversation down to mono and then i will make destructive edits and then hey look at that yeah and then that file that's the conversation like it's 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 been mixed it's been edited right that's the conversation and then then I have another, same as you, I have a different session template, if you will, for the full episode where the intro music's already in there, and I just bring in that edited conversation, and I put it on its own mm-hmm. track. Definitely. Yeah. I love doing it that way. You mix the 32-bit 44.1, and by the way, 44.1, is, that's, I'm in my opinion, it's totally, f- like, 44.1 or 48, yeah. they're both good, I don't, but don't, don't tell Alan Tepper that's frightening yeah that's frightening don't tell alan tepper he's he he ha, he runs the 48 kilohertz alliance <laughs> mm, mm, no yeah. they're powerful i don't want to get on their bad side well and, and i've been um, inducted into their i don't know if it's the hall of fame or whatever but anyway he does he does some awesome stuff but i mean i get it it's fine 48 48 k is totally fine there's two reasons and they are both really dumb and make me look like an old person who's afraid of change. Um, <laughs> but one, I ran into issues many, many years ago making MP3s at 48K that would not play correctly. They would play upsped yeah. or down, whichever direction. I think it was up. They, they would play at the wrong speed when played in a well-known commercial MP3 player and software. And I was just like, ooh, that's not great. Okay, I'm going to stick with 44.1. And while I was in audio school many years ago, after college, I took a year and I went to audio school uh, at a recording studio outside of Washington, D.C. And I had, I had a professor who, in his previous life, had an advanced degree in math and taught math. And he was of the opinion that 44, that 48 is not worth the conversion that whatever you gained with recording at 48 you lost in the conversion to 44 one 
And it's been 15 years. I'm sure that's not true anymore. But 48 just makes me uncomfortable. Yeah. I'm not I'm not into it. So yeah. so 44 one, but I do want all the dynamic range I can get. So 32 bit really, I'm a huge fan of. Yeah, that's awesome. Mixing down to 32 bit. And the files when you, are gigantic, but oh well. Yeah, I was gonna say you you archive the wave file as well as the mp3 for every episode correct? i do yeah oh yeah i and th- and the raw tracks in my session yeah some of my individual show folders can be three and a half gigs sometimes more if yeah. they're if there's a lot of audio involved um which is fine you know i have a big hard drive and i save everything and i don't i don't know what the long-term plan for that is but right. i hold on to everything just in case yeah well that's what engineers do right <laughs> that's what we do yeah I mean, I in so many years, it's it's funny. I talk about, you know, how audition is for quick and dirty audio and you make something and then you forget about it and you never look at it again, at it again. In so many years of engineering, I have never had to go back for a file that I have hoarded, but at the same time, I continue to hoard all of my files. Right. Well, there's going to be one time that someone says, "Hey, do we have, still have that file?" and you're going to be the hero. I hope so. I'm waiting. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, one thing I thought Where's of with, my award <laughs> with this show, I actually thought of like starting like a Patreon where like if people pay like, you know, a few bucks a month, like instead of them just downloading the MP3 through the regular podcast feed, I, I would give them a link to download the full, you know, 24 bit. 48 kilohertz wave file Ooh. for each episode <laughs> there are people that would do that maybe like two but they're exactly out there. yeah like two people would be like dude this is awesome <laughs> that's an extra six dollars a month for you <laughs> you know it's it's like in theory kind of a good idea but it just it's not real it's not reality probably probably not worth it though barry would you ever try something like that that's frightening i know man it, i'm telling you <laughs> so, all right. So that's cool. So uh, your whole workflow with Adobe Audition, and then you archive the files. And how do you tag mm-hmm. the MP3s? I don't. It all gets um, that's handled. I think on the other end. Once I once I hand it off, got it. I sa- I save it as a plain file, and I believe they are using Megaphone right now, and. Cadence does. So I'm not sure what the whole okay. uh, back end magic, what happens on the back end. So I just kind of hand over a file and hope for the best. And I just thought of another question. You just attended podcast movement and, you know, you're an audio engineer. So like, what was your experience talking with like regular podcasters? Like what, because my, my general feeling over the years, as I mentioned in the intro of the show is that a lot of people in podcasting they don't they don't have a f- very good grasp on audio production and that's why like saving you know archiving your 32 bit files like people don't do that but we do it cuz we're engineers and uh, so how so did you feel there's like a a difference in in production styles or difference in philosophy between you and and you know, the average person at podcast. Very movie? much so. I, I would say that there's like two main camps and then there's me kind of, I, there might be other people out there like me. I hope there are, but I was, I was surprised by the real kind of studio esque time intensive, like punch and sparkle compress everything school that I, that I found there. I mean, I mostly went to technical track talks. Um, you were at most of them. You heard me so, speak too. You were there. You were in my I session. Did. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I was just surprised. And I think this was, this is what, at the beginning of the show. I mentioned, you know, I learned a lot. And one of the things I, I learned, I think was kind of how disconnected I am personally from the podcast culture, if you can call it that, but the, the podcasting world, I hesitate to say the podcast movement, um, and just how like apart from 
production trends, if you want to call them that, or production styles, how, how far apart from that I am. So that was surprising just seeing how much people are, how much effort, time, plug-in dollars people are putting into their shows. What I was aware of was the whole world of podcasts that have kind of really minimal quality and, you know, right. c- kind of just people talking into a mic and calling in a day. Like, obviously I knew that was out there. There's a lot of podcasts that are fairly popular that to me have kind of like borderline quality. Right. And then there's me where I'm kind of not really aiming for either of those. Right. Uh, Certainly I'm not aiming for the sparkly bits and, but I do want things to sound naturalistic. I'm going for a very kind of, this was two people talking in a room. This was what they sounded like talking in a room. That's, right. you know, that's, that's my goal. Yeah. I hear you. There's, there's two different extremes and what, you know, one difference between you and I, and, and it's not just a difference between you and I, it's a different on a higher level. It's a difference between an audio engineer who came up in the music business making records right. versus an audio engineer who came through radio, like, and, and doing stuff live and using different, processors and yeah and i mean radio is very much a few things so i was not only i was not only kind of shaped by radio but i was shaped by public radio very specifically Mm. i spent a year in am radio which um just kind of ruined my ears for compression for a while (laughs) everything was just squashed all to hell and then i came out of there and i was like why isn't anything compressed and then i eventually went to the other end of so many years in public radio where the slightest bit of compression makes me nervous and i you know i do i forgot to mention this but i do when i get my individual tracks i do run them through some compression just to you know control the peaks a little bit get my average gain up a little, my average level up a little higher. Right. Um, so every individual track is getting compression. I'm not totally scared of compression, but I have a real kind of deep inside response to like that real low compressed FM sound. Like that drives me crazy and I don't, I don't want to hear it. Right. Um, I don't want to listen to it as an engineer. I don't want to listen to it as a listener. So I try to avoid that at all costs. You know, I have just, I have so many years of taking a person and sitting them in front of a Neumann U89 and kind of getting this very, what I think is a very transparent idea of what they sound like, a very kind of accurate, clean recording of their voice. And it's hard to shake that off. You know, that's that's really kind of influenced the way that I handle mixing and editing and recording. Right. So you were working in public radio for many years. And when we, when we got to talk at podcast movement, which by the way, we met at the meetup that Steve Stewart coordinated. Such a good idea for the podcast editors club. Shout out to Steve Stewart. I was really glad that Steve did that. That ended up being uh, one of the better choices that I made was going to that that week. Yeah. And of course, Barry was there. People don't know. Barry, my sidekick here, he was there with us. And uh, Keeps Barry, a low profile. Barry, do you remember what you said after the meetup? When I asked you, what did you think of the meetup? What were your exact words? There's no activity, no giggle, no nothing. <laughs> Dude, I thought there was plenty of giggle, Barry. That was yeah. harsh. I, well, thanks. <laughs> Barry, did you uh you you giggled, right? Yeah, oh yeah. I know. So all right. So anyway, I don't know what Barry's thinking, but anyway, Steve Stewart, thank you for organizing that. We got to talking and you were telling me about you were producing, I think it was a day was it a day every day you were producing this show, this live show, and you had to run yeah. ads and you had to manage the or, or the the host had to hit like these timing markers. Tell us all about that. Yeah, so I worked at a at the NPR station in Washington DC um WAMU and while I was there we syndicated a national talk show and so this is a pretty standard format you know you've got a host they have a couple of guests hour one is usually pretty newsy you bring a few guests in to talk about the news you know 
you got to you got to play the balance game. So you go left, right and center with your guests. And then that's politically not audio. And then hour two is usually more kind of squishy culture stuff. Someone who wrote a book, something like that. And so the show goes up every day. It's got roughly about a million listeners among, you know, a hundred or more public radio stations around the country. And it really is kind of the essence of live radio where it's not stopping no matter what you do. It's coming. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta do the thing. Uh, cause, cause if, if you stop, everybody knows and they're all waiting for you. And there's just, you know, a lot of ways for things to get really busy, really crazy. So there were a lot of times where, we had we had production to record you know the host comes in and say the host is running behind sometimes you know we lived in the nation's capital sometimes there's traffic all the time there's traffic right maybe this is a pretty common thing where the guests a, a guest will cancel on you at the last minute they got a sick kid or they can't make it for whatever reason so they've got to scramble and find another guest or They've got there's breaking news overnight and they've got a last minute topic change. So these poor producers are trying to put together an entire hour long show in between like 7 a.m. when they get into work and 10 o'clock when the show goes up. Mm. So say your host comes back a little bit late. Say your host comes back at 930 maybe. Oh. So you got 30 minutes till the show goes up and they record 10 minutes of continuity. They record a billboard for the top of each hour they record a bunch of different promos that we you got to chop up and uh send down to npr so that they can get distributed to the stations and so then it's 9 40 and you got 20 minutes and you're supposed to line check with npr at 9 50 <laughs> so all of a sudden you've got you know 18 minutes to do 10 minutes of audio and Sometimes it's shorter than that. Sometimes your host doesn't come back until 940 or 945 because right. they're busy and they got things to do. So, so often I would end up in a position where my host would finish recording. I would line check with NPR. And, and line and check would... means that you're, you're getting ready to go live and you're sort of like sending some information down the line to make sure they right, get it right. properly. So we've... Um, at that station, different stations do it differently because different inf infrastructure exists. But at that station, we had a T1 connection da down to NPR. So they have a switching system so that at 959, 56, something like that, their switching system automatically takes the input from our station, from my control room, and routes it up to the satellite so that, the, so that it can then be, you know, go down to all the stations who have their satellite dishes. Right. So 10 minutes till you call up master control. You say, Hey, it's Andrew at AMU. They know you by name. Cause you talk every day and you send them some tone, you know, back on the old analog console days, you know, you'd send them tone at unity and then you'd send them some audio and they're just checking left, right balance quality. It's a little quality control thing so that they know the show is going to sound good. Right. And then you hang up. No big deal. Takes two minutes. Uh, you just got to do it every day because your show has to hit the satellite every right. day. So that's a little bit of time. So you line check and then I would cut together the billboard as quickly as possible. And the billboard is a little. Just explain that real yeah, quick. So the, the billboard, the way um, NPR has a very fixed clock. Well, this show had a very fixed clock. So at 10 o'clock straight up, there's the billboard. It's a little one minute, 58 seconds, really. And it's an intro to the show. It's the host saying, this is who's on, you know, this is X show. This is who's on. You can get a great example with any, you know, Fresh Air has them. Here and Now has them. Most NPR shows that have a news hole will have a billboard. Because at 01, the choice comes, do you have a show or do you pop out for the news? And most, you know, most news shows pop out for the news hole. So a lot of music shows will just have a full like 59 minute show. They don't they don't care about the news so much, but news and talk programming cuts away from 01 to 06. And that's when NPR does their feed. So the first so, one minute is the billboard and then the next five mm -hmm. minutes is the news. Right. 
from from NPR. They have a um, I, I'm working on old clocks. I'm not sure if these clocks are fully accurate anymore, but they right. would do one minute right at the top for the billboard. Then from 01 to 04, they do the newscast one, which is the most important stories. Then they offer a little cutaway where stations can cut away to do a local cast if they feel so inclined. If you don't do the local cast, you stay with the network and they'll do two more minutes of news. They finish that up at 0545. They play a funding credit for the news. And then at 06, it's back to you where I would play a little thir- a little 30 second music bed. And then at 0630, you play the show theme and the show starts. Uh. So I'm I'm getting the billboard together at 51, 52, 53. Yeah. <laughs> there were a couple of times cuz you know the other thing that's going on is that there's people in the studio. The host is get going in and sitting sitting down. Right. The guests are going in and sitting down. You've got to adjust mics, make sure your all their headphones are plugged in, working cuz you know, a, equipment you use every day tends to fall apart after a while. You got to give them the little spiel on this is how you use a microphone. I want you about this far away. If you, you know, there's a cough button, but if you look at the cough button that's labeled cough, it just makes you want to cough. So just don't think about that. <laughs> so, you know, you got to give them that whole thing before the show starts. So there were a handful of times where I was playing audio out of the Adobe Multitrack. Not my dream scenario, but, oh. you know, that ten, it ticks over to 10 o'clock. I don't I haven't taken the time to mix down a file. So I just hit the space bar and let it rip. And, <laughs> wow. You know, it works. Um, so I just want to I just want to emphasize something here. Everyone listening, like in the world of podcasting, isn't it great we do not have this pressure? I can just feel the pressure, Andrew, that you're that you're going through. And this was years ago. And you're like, the clock's yeah. ticking. You got to finish this little piece. You got to start it on the hour, exactly on, and come mm-hmm. back, play music, train the guest. Oh, my God, dude. Wow. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's. I don't think I can function without the the pressure. I'm a procrastinator by nature. So I think a, a show that doesn't have deadlines for me is never going to happen. Oh. Uh. Um, you know, I've had, I've had a bunch of these, I think live, live audio is pretty similar as far as the pressure goes. You got to get things up and going. Right. I was a projectionist for a while, which is a pretty similar gig as far as pressure. Cause if you don't start that movie on time, people are turning around and looking at you. Oh my God. There's no projectionist anymore, but that's how it used to be. Right. And the thing is, it doesn't end once, you know, say I get the billboard up. Great. Okay. That's one minute. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You got you got fifty nine more minutes in the hour. You got to deal with yeah. So you got to make sure you do talk to the guests. You got to make sure you have your music for 06. You got to have your theme for 0630. Everybody's got to be ready. You got to have good levels on all your guests. And this is if you don't have any remote guests. If you have any remote guests, it's even worse because quite frequently we'd have somebody on an ISDN in another studio in some far off country mm. or some far off city. Um, you know, we'd have live guests from Australia and some poor, you know, ABC engineer is staying until 10 o'clock at night so he can engineer this talk show ses- session. Right. And so we're call I'm calling him at 930 trying to link up and you're trying to make codecs talk to each other. That's very difficult. Wow. And then once say, you know, you get into the show at 0630, then you've got to still finish your production. You still got like 10 pieces of audio to put together. So while the show's going on, I'm sitting there in queue for people who don't know radio consoles. They have this lovely thing called queue where there's a third speaker, usually a crappy speaker, just off to the side so that you can preview anything coming down the line. You can preview satellite feeds if you're taking a satellite feed. You can preview a phone guest. You can preview an ISDN guest. Super useful thing to have. So I'd bring up my audition PC in queue and I would just mix promos and cut promos in queue while I was running the talk show as well. (laughs) And uh, explain to everyone how you have to manage the host of the show, because with such a strict timetable, like like everyone, probably almost everyone listening has a podcast or maybe you've hosted a show or something. And 
hosting a show like the, the way I host my show, there's no time limit. Like I don't, we're just going to talk. And then when we're done no talking post to hit, it'll be over. It's over. But on radio, it's like you have a certain amount of time. And then your engineer, Andrew, on the other side of the glass is like, you got to like, you got to be done in 15 seconds. And like, so tell us how that works. Yeah. So every, every host has, every host is different. And so you kind of have to adapt to your host's needs. And as is kind of true in so many portions of engineering, you, you kind of have to lie to your host sometimes. <laughs> like, you know, how, like guys who come up in music, you know that you you tell every band, no, no, I'm not rolling. This is just the pra practice take. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, li little lies like that. Yep. And so every host say, you know, same talk show there's a break at 18 minutes past the hour from 19 minutes past the hour in fact from 19 to 20 there's a one minute break so i've you've got bed music you have to play leading up to that break and then you got to fade that bed music out you got to play 60 seconds of music to fill that break so that stations can leave their fader up they'll just leave their satellite fader up and use the music you're sending them oh. and then they'll talk you know they'll do their weather and they'll do their local content over that music oh. so you got to get your host out before that 19 um and there's a little bit more difficulty here because you're in delay you've gone between when you started the show and between when you hit that first break you've hit the you've hit the ramp up button on your profanity delay so you're probably 10 seconds behind real, real time. So really, you're going out at 1850. So uh. some hosts want to be notified well in advance. So somehow, some hosts, you, get, you start your two-minute clock at 16, and it'll count down to 18, and then they'll kind of wrap things up after that. Some hosts, they see a down clock and they freeze. They get real nervous. Oh. Usually that's fill-in hosts. You know, your, your regular host is away. You get a fill-in host. And 16, you know, it's 1640 maybe. You give a two-minute clock. Usually I would, I'd blip the talk back just so that the host is aware. I'd point at the clock so that they see, oh, there's a two-minute clock. Sometimes they freak out. Sometimes they get nervous and they go to, they just immediately they'll interrupt the guest. Then they'll go to break. Oh. And then all of a sudden you're rolling a CD for two minutes, trying to keep enough music to get you to the break. Oh God. Um, and then some hosts just want to keep talking and keep talking. Some guests want to keep talking. God help you. If you have a Senator on your show, oh, geez. they, they don't stop talking. So, you know, if, if they're in studio, the host can maybe wrangle them. But if you've got a senator on the phone, oh, it's so hard to get them out in time. Oh, man. So so that you can hit your break. Sometimes you've got to, you know, we, we moved into the digital world where now we had individual talkbacks. That's a dream because you can just, you know, you can shout down the line real quick to say, hey, we're 20 seconds out and maybe they'll listen to you. But. Um, you know, you just got a lot of moving parts that all have to converge at the same time. And it's just there's a lot going on for live talk shows. And hopefully, you know, the listener doesn't know about any of it. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned a profanity delay. And I um, actually, Barry, dug up a tweet from you, Andrew, when you worked at the station. Um, he's going to read the tweet oh. here on the air. This is uh, uh -oh. this is Andrew's tweet uh, from back then. And they were cussing up a storm. Profanities left, profanities right. <laughs> that's it, man. That's it. That's the real. That's how it really goes down. <laughs> did you ever? Did you ever have a host just lose it and start cursing up a storm? No, no. The host knows. The host knows. My my worst delay story is my own fault. Um, I think one of the, one of the things I told you a podcast movement is um, you're going to make every mistake. When you, when you work in radio, you're going to make every mistake. The goal is you only make them once. Right. So I made a delay mistake once. Um, we had, I believe it was, it was, it was a relative of. Okay. And he just kind of very casually 
dropped an F-bomb. And everyone in the control room kind of stopped and we looked at each other and we were like, oh, geez. Okay, (laughs) here we go. And so I tried to massage it. Rather than doing the smart thing, which is reaching up, slapping the crap out of the dump button, and moving on with my life, I tried to massage it. So I popped the satellite feed into Q, and I was listening to him. I knew I had about four or five seconds, which in radio is a long time. So I'm listening to him. I'm listening to him. And so right before he comes up to, to where he drops the F-bomb, I smacked the, del- I smacked the dump button. The thing I forgot to account for was the satellite delay. Oh, There's seven tenths of a second each direction going up and down to the satellite. So in reality, I was late and the way it worked out was what what went out to air was him talking, him talking. Ten seconds got cut out directly into the F-bomb, which went out to every, you know, all of the stations and a million oh. listeners, and then it continued on, and the delay started ramp- ramping up again. Oh. And I went, oh, because no. <laughs> you don't want to be that guy when when anything happens. Um, you got to send a message out to all the other stations. There's a system in place by which stations communicate with each other. So then we had to send out a message, unintended profanity, please be aware. Oh. And then we had to make it good. I can't remember. I think. We had a pre-delay recording rolling, so I was able to reconst- reconstruct the segment and then just edit that sentence out and then stretch it back out to make time. But so that's for stations that take it later. Stations that took it live, they got it in all its glory, and you know nobody made any big complaints. But uh, I felt I felt pretty bad about that one. Yeah, well, like you said, mistakes happen, and and you probably didn't do that again, right? I definitely did not do that one again. That is, um, any you know, r- potential radio engineers out there, just hit the dump button. Just hit the just dump, hit right? It. Don't be fancy. Just hit the dump, right? Barry, uh, Barry, remember that time? Of course, Barry's with me here in the studio. Barry, remember that time that Ralph M. Rivera was on live radio? D- d- you remember that? Every second word was a hip word <laughs> i know every second word <laughs> ralph was just dropping them he was spewing them not even dropping them so i've done some tape syncs like that for <laughs> sure some remote <laughs> sessions like that where you're like oh yeah they're gonna be cutting this one a lot right so this is wow i just managing everything i, I just i'm still on edge and, and i wasn't even the one back in those days doing what you were doing in the studio it's a but. lot of fun it really is you know you go up you do two hours of nerve-wracking <laughs> like you know flop sweat inducing <laughs> radio and then you just walk away from it it's just done it's just gone and it's like it's good and bad because you know if you screw up, if you forget to hit the dump button, or if you blow a break, it's gone. It's it's a river flowing away from you forever. But also all of the good things that you do every day are gone and forgotten about immediately. So it's it teaches you to be very zen about your mistakes, but at the same time, to try and make sure that you never make the same mistake again. Right. Wow. So these days, though, working on pod save america and other other podcasts it's a lot different right this is like easy for you it it is it is it's still it's still stressful the fast turnaround is its very own specific thing and it's exhilarating in a way because you're just like all right all right it's 3 30 i have 45 minutes to cut an hour 10 of news let's go jeez um and it's it still provides that little like juice that that excitement but it's it's lower stakes a little bit um it's just kind of along a different axis i guess right well this has been awesome chatting with you andrew i mean we we could probably go on forever and i think probably down the road i would love to have you back on the show and we can really go into more stuff 
So everybody, check out Pod Save America. Check out Andrew's work, and I'll put links because um, you're working on some other stuff too. So check the show notes for other links. And Andrew, you have to do one other thing. And by the way, I didn't mention to everybody, we didn't mention that the way we're recording this is, Andrew, you're sitting in a studio. Oh, yeah, we're tape syncing. Yeah. We're tape syncing, which tape syncing means... This is the thing that more people should know about. (laughs) In one of the sessions, in one of the technical sessions, there was a situation where a woman was asking... She had a whole setup. She had a she had an interface. She had a good mic, but then she wanted to do phone interviews, and she was asking about what can she put on her phone to get better quality. And I, I think she left before the end of the session, which made me sad because I really wanted to talk to her about tape syncing. It's such a useful way. I was like, you don't need to buy anything else. You have it all. Just tape sync it. It's so great. Right. So in in the in podcasting terms, what what we call it in the podcast industry is called a double ender, which means yeah, that works too. Well, I mean, I'm just saying like that's the term that's been used for years, and so a lot of people in the podcast space have heard that term. That's I'm just I just wanted to be sure to be very clear that a double ender is the same thing as a tape sync. Right. Yeah. So yeah, of course. If any, it, I mean, I'm very happy and grateful that a lot of, most of the guests on this show are you know savvy enough to to record themselves locally and then send me the file later so which of course is the double ender or tape sync so and it always sounds much better so thanks for yeah, doing that and so cheat and get great quality yeah so and we're actually so we're connected i called you through skype but i called you on a phone so right now when i'm interviewing you i'm hearing you on the phone but the people who are going to listen to the final episode, they're going to hear you for the whole episode. You're going to sound great. I hope so. Well, I'm mixing I mean, it, man. I'm so. making no promises about the signal chain in this room. I hope it's good. Oh, but uh, I'm sure you can do your magic either way. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'll go to town on that. Um, but yeah, so Andrew, the only the last thing we got to do is yell. Are you Are you willing to yell something? I'm not much of a yeller, but um, all right. Well, sure. you can. You can like growl or something but anyway at the, at the very end as soon as the music kicks in we're going to yell sound great so that's what we do sound and everyone great. listening Sounds in great. your car or jogging down the road I don't care if you're walking down a street I want you to yell sound great so everybody turns their head and looks at you and funny okay so anyway thank you Andrew for being our guest and go ahead sound great sound great yeah oh yeah no way crazy yeah oh yeah
Yeah.